Welcome, dear ladies and gentlemen. I have the honor to host the last panel in today's conference, the heritage of the Western civilization in the modern world. I would like the panelists to take their places. Some of them are already here. I'm very happy about that. I would like to remind who participates in this panel. Uh, Mr. Francisco Javier Borrego Borrego, uh, former Justice of European Court of Human Rights, who will uh, uh, make a speech, an introductory speech to this panel. Następnie then uh, uh, Dr. Jan Majchrowski, professor of the War University of Warsaw, uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Professor uh, um, Maria Gintow Jankowicz, a former Justice of the Constitutional Tribunal, Professor, uh, Professor Zbigniew Cieślak, former Justice of the Constitutional Tribunal as well, Mr. Sebastian Kaleta, uh, Secretary of State in the Ministry of Justice, he is with us, and uh, online uh, we'd like to connect with Ms. Ligia de Jesus Castali, uh, who is the professor at law, of law at um, Eve Maria School of Law. I know that this is the last part, and everybody would like to finish faster uh, earlier, but I hope that our panel would make these last minutes would not be a waste of time for you. There is just two things I would like to mention, and these are the questions I would like to direct to you before I um, uh, give the floor to Mr. Francisco Javier Borrego Borrego. Uh, um, and namely, since we're speaking of the heri legal heritage of the Western uh, civilization, the modern world, we have to notice that in the last uh, few decades, this heritage has been greatly changed. For example, in these aspects like free abortion, uh, euthanasia, um, same-sex marriages, what is related with these fears, there has been a total remodeling of uh, the legal uh, perspective in uh, most countries of the West. So can we ask, uh, we, we can ask the question, can we still speak of any Heri legal heritage of the Western civilization today. This is a question which I, of course, I'd like to be answered in the uh, later part uh, of our panel. And now I'd like to give the floor uh, to the former uh, Justice of the European Court of Human Rights, Mr. Francisco Javier Borrego Borrego, who would perhaps answer some of these questions. Buenas tardes. Good evening. I will be speaking in Spanish, but there is translation into English and Polish. I would be very happy to speak Polish, but unfortunately God has not given this talent to me. Of course, I'm uh, uh, so please uh, accept my excuses, I mean the organizers. I would like to start my speech with uh, double thanks. In the first place, uh, to Ms. Ligia, Ligia, Ligia Castaldi, who called me and asked me to participate in this conference, and to Mr. Bartizel, uh, who has been so kind to invite me in the name of Collegium Intermarium. And in the second place, I would like to very, very strongly thank uh, to Ordo Iuris uh, for their very existence and for their work. My speech uh, can be summed up in three points. The first one is to rem re remember uh, the old Latin words were in the Western civilization. Uh, I mean potestas and autoritas. Uh, potestas is the possibility to impose obligatory decisions. Who can have the potestas in our society, democratic society? 
those who are elected by the people. What is the situation today? That those who are elected by, by the uh, people are very limited, are very dependent on the so-called public opinion. And the so-called public opinion nowadays uh, has a certain intrinsic error, a misunderstanding, uh, which has been mentioned by Elisabeth Neumann, uh, calling it the spiral of silence. Uh, some people are shouting, and the great majority of the citizens become silent. And the others, because of cowardice or comfort, support this, minor, this minority opinion. But how does Neumann ex, um, explain this? That this tiny opinion is becoming like a spiral, becoming stronger and stronger, and facing the silence of the other side, the cowardice of the other side, becomes in front of the eyes of the politicians, consciously or subconsciously, uh, the public opinion. This is the potestas. And against, we have auctoritas. Who has this auctoritas? These are the people, the persons or groups that because of their experience, because of their work, knowledge are respected in the society and their opinions influence on the, uh, influence the society. So on the one hand, we have potestas, which is imposed obligatorily, very dependent on the public opinion, falsified public opinion. And on the other side, we have auctoritas of certain groups and persons of, a different, of different categories. Second point. Um, there is a question, uh, the authority, autoritas, uh, today, it penetrates the society the way it should? Personally, I doubt that. Why? Well, look, many years ago, thousands of years ago, Jesus Christ, in the parable of the unfaithful administrator in, the, uh, uh, in St. Lucas said, the sons of the world, or of darkness, depends on the translation, are wiser than the sons of the light. I am not the son of the light. I would like to be, I'm doing my best, but I don't think I am. I don't want to qualify anybody, neither a person nor a group, as the sons of the darkness. But they are here and there. And they're much wiser than us. Who are we who pretend, who want to be sons of light, people with uh, great uh, knowledge, great experience? But hey, be careful, in this very society, you cannot write more than 140 characters in Twitter because they won't read it. This is the image of today's society. What we do today are great doctrinal uh, works, thick books, deep, full of knowledge that we and only we read. We do not penetrate the society, in my modest opinion, the way we should. That's why my second point, I'd like to conclude asking the God for his help to, to support people and groups that are the impersonation of uh, Auctoritas today to be wise, not to be good, not to be intelligent. Yes, many of these wonderful, many of these things, but wise in the practical way. 
And in my third point, why do I say this? Because we that could think that we are the sons of darkness, but we are very, very, very clever, very wise. I'll give you an example. In one of the meetings in Rome, I was surprised by the expression gender. I asked, excuse me, have we accepted that gender has uh, sub, no, sub, uh, es que replaced the sex? No, uh, but people are saying, no, it's a lost battle. We have to use it. I said, no, sex is a biological different. Gender is a cultural expression that anybody can have the way they like. Don't mistake these two. Oh, but Javier, you know, no, no, I mean, it's a lost battle. I said, no, there are no battles to lose. You fight until the last minute. Another example. Do you remember uh, of the right to abortion? Nobody speaks about the right to abortion. They say uh, right of, to free choice. And even even the right to reproductory health, uh, uh, which is achieved by the voluntary interruption of pregnancy, and we have bought, we have assimilated these terms, absurd terms, reproductive health. If we are speaking about no, uh, not having a child. Reproductory health by killing a child, a human being. I mean, that's absurd. And the other thing, voluntary interruption of pregnancy. What happens after an abortion? Can we have it after the birth? In Spanish, uh, English, French, Czech, Pol Polish, Hungarian, in all the languages, uh, to interrupt is to stop something, to continue. But this, this is what it really means, is to terminate. But we say interrupt, voluntarily interrupt. We're not interrupting anything. We're terminating. And this is clear, should be clear to everyone. Do you remember uh, Victor, uh, the words by Victor Klemper uh, who speak about the Nazis? Uh, the sons of darkness are, are very clever. They are doing it very well. They are using the words like an arsenic, drop after drop. And in the end, we are speaking of genders, of voluntary interruption of uh, uh, pregnancy, not even abortion. Let's call it directly. Reproductive health, ha, ha, ha. No, they have won or they are almost winning this battle because we have become silent. But apart from the battle for the language, they know how to use a very clever strategy. I'll give you two examples. Uh, cases A, B, C against Ireland in the European Tribunal of uh, Human Rights. Three, three ladies that painted a, a terrible image, uh, poor situation, you know, uh, in terrible situation, hell, un very unhealthy, uh, living in poverty, uh, suffering from cancer, have so many children, and they had to. Um, uh, abort, um, I mean, sorry, voluntarily interrupt the pregnancy. And uh, going to London, traveling to London to, uh, to continue the procedure. Uh, and pro-abortion uh, uh, organization in Ireland, very well known in Strasbourg, presents these three cases. But please, pay attention. No se ha efectuado there has been no activity taken in Ireland. The first legal uh, action was taken in Strasbourg. The second point, there was not even one document that would confirm 
tiene that cancer. Miss B has cancer. Pobres todas. That they are all very poor. Que muchos hijos. No that they have so many kids. Nada. There are no documents, no proofs, absolutely nada. nothing that would confirm these uh, suppositions. ¿Qué hace el gobierno what de does the Irish government do? Perdón. Sorry. Somos hijos de la luz. We are the sons of light. Además, we are the good guys. And also uh, very well behaved. So we will not help you in Ireland, but we will send your application of these ABC no cases and no answers. There, are no, there is no uh, way to do it no internally. However, uh, we, can, uh, we can change the situation in Ireland. Constitution, uh, norms, uh, doctrines, books, uh, and the answer of the constitutional uh, of the uh, tribunal in Strasbourg. There is no support in the documents that would justify. Uh, what they want. There should be uh, where it ends all these three cases. But the clever strategy uh, by the sons of darkness answered. They said there are no documents of any kind, but since the Irish government I, I'm saying, so, you know, full of goodwill, has given us all the responsibility uh, to speak of the situation uh, of abortion in Ireland, we have uh, analyzed uh, the situation. So we'd like to condemn Ireland for the first time for abortion on the basis of another wisdom, cleverness. Uh, of the Sons of Darkness. Abortion has always been seen in Strasbourg as uh, the right against life. But in the Polish case, Alit Alicia Tysiąc from Poland was a lady who said she was very poor, uh, she had very poor uh, uh, sight, she was pregnant, she would lose uh, sight completely if she gives birth, and the Polish government presented all the documents and opinions, uh, but unfortunately, this, uh, that this is not the case. But unfortunately, in order to, uh, um, to try to avoid the discussion on abortion and the second article, number two, the sons of darkness are very clever, very wise. They said, no, no, not this right. Uh, the right to life is complicated. It sounds badly. We have to use the right uh, to private life of the mother. But what does one have to do with the private life of the mother? Why don't we say of the father as well? And above all else, I don't know very well Warsaw, but I can imagine that Warsaw uh, has to have some kind of a circular road that goes around the city, like most of the great uh, great cities, so that people can, uh, can circulate around. The Tribunal of Human Rights in Strasbourg discovered the way around human rights, private life, the privacy of life. And for the first time, such a serious right uh, has been considered, as the right to life, has been considered inferior to the right to privacy. And that the circular way, the way around, has been used in, uh, in order to avoid facing the problem directly. Uh, the Tishon's case, um, in, this, in this case, I prepared a dissident opinion, speaking with uh, many, many important people from Poland. Um, they asked me uh, why did, I asked them why didn't they ask the repetition of the case before the Great Hall, I said, there are six against one, that is me, and one of them, I, I, I told them that one of them should ask to, to revisit the case. But unfortunately, the Polish government said they can't see any precedent um, to uh, have this uh, trial held in front of the uh, Great Hall. 
paradiso, that paradiso in, what was the result? Uh, the Tishons and the cases ABC Se arregló un poco la gran sala, gracias a Dios. Pero están uh, utilizando they use this case, la vía periférica. Uh, they use the way around against the Article 8, no using the um, authentica, not the authentic way. There should be speaking of the right to life, not a private right. Article 2. Bueno, they use the Article 8 instead. Muchísimo más ejemplo, pero I could give many, many more examples, but I need to keep my, uh, uh, to speak concisely. So I'm finishing, and the way I'd like to finish is with two words, which I would like to you to hear. I would like them to leave my, uh, my mouth like the old dragons, hearing, he heard well in these halls. Courage and wisdom. Muchas gracias. Courage and wisdom. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, that's right. Clever, cleverness and uh, courage is what we need. Maybe that's not really like, at least in Warsaw, with this circular road. I'm not afraid if we have already managed to create it so far. But yes, uh, what has been very important in this speech was uh, the, the manipulation that we are experiencing in the language and the impossibility that is a consequence of it to, uh, to discuss it with the public opinion even based to some things that would, uh, we could consider as basic. Uh, I would now like to ask uh, Professor Gintov Tjankovic to, uh, to take the floor now. Ladies and gentlemen, I admit that in the first place I would like to discuss our today's topic, um, the topic of uh, our panel, which in my opinion, after these introductory words, I'm, I'm even, uh, even, it is even clearer for me that this is a very broad topic on the one hand, and um, not very precise in a way. Uh, namely, how should we understand the legal heritage of the Western civilization, legal heritage of the Western civilization? Uh, in, in today's world is clear. Yes, that's an easier part of the topic. So I would like to be a little bit, to go a bit against uh, the current. Uh, to share this thought, what if we understood uh, this legal heritage of the Western civilization as uh, the author of this topic would understand as an analysis of the world of the Constitution of the United States adopted in, nine, in 18, seven, uh, 1782? Uh, that is an act from more than 200 years. If such an important legal act as a constitution can be drawn, which has been um, in power since the end of the 18th century, is it already a part of the legal heritage of today's world? Or maybe it excludes from the term of legal heritage the fact that this is a constitution which is still valid, if we could say so, live and kicking. So I, I think I, I should admit that this topic is not entirely clear. Um, to me. I have to admit uh, to each of you that perhaps I should not speak here uh, on a topic that is neither my specialty in academically nor professionally, and but only 
Uh, only the fact that the invitation uh, related uh, with a very important uh, educational initiative um, has convinced me to come here, and I'm very grateful for this invitation. So what do the uh, organizers mean by asking one of the, f uh, by giving to one of the panels a title like that? I suppose that our European, uh, European, European centralism uh, makes us think that we have these three uh, pillars of the Western uh, European civilizations. For example, if we speak of the legal culture, well, the Roman law. If the Roman law, then a few words on the Roman uh, legal traditions. Uh, I would like to. I would like to say, if you, if you like, but I would like to share one Roman uh, achievement, which to me is one of the crucial things for today's world. So, in the first place, in the Roman law. Um, the many centuries of the reception of Roman law in Europe has led to the situation in which it's true that the foundations of modern law is the Roman law. That's a fact. However, this is true only under one condition. If I add that the foundation of private law is the Roman law, unfortunately, from what we have said so far, I have never been a specialist in civil law. That's why it would be difficult for me to refer historically to the antiquity and to present any um, material catalog of this Roman law heritage in today's legal uh, systems of Europe. That's why I would like to say that the Roman law as a foundation of today's uh, legal solutions uh, refers in its greatest part to the private law. I admit that I don't know if the division between the public and private law can be derived from the antiquity or perhaps it's a bit, uh, uh, it's a, a bit later invention, which I believe is a very important one. I think it's very important to divide the law and divide the, all these aspects uh, to um, private or public law. Uh, I suffered greatly through all the decades in the public um, under the communism that excluded uh, very strongly. Um, the, the, this division has been was treated uh, by the communists as non-existent, even though it had been prevalent in all the world until the Second World War. Then it, has, it was dropped completely. In my opinion, it's very, very important. For example, the fact that uh, among the legal heritage of our civilization, we count the prohibition of uh, carrying the rules accepted in the private law to the public law. That's why the public law should be governed by different sets of rules. What I wanted to say, this is one of one or two sentences to treat this problem from a broader perspective, difficult, um, many, many uh, harsh words were said about using law nowadays in the modern world, not only now on our continent. Well, allegedly, supposedly, I will say who, who said that in a minute. In the end of the Republic, the Romans, um, so it's the second century before Christ, the Romans very precisely differentiated between the Roman term use the law from other normative systems, not in any way less important, 
but in different uh, areas, in different uh, periods, perhaps even more important than use, but not yet lacks. Namely, they were able to uh, precisely differentiate between the law and the religion and morality and the custom. The custom, which might, in the broader perspective, on those, all those normative systems, uh, the systems that regulate the society, we could, we could even name it a tradition. We have different traditions, local ones, tribal ones, professional ones. So I believe that uh, uh, this, this thesis that has been maintained by three uh, important authors, uh, specialists in uh, the doctrine of uh, um, Roman law, um, in their book Wojciech Dajczak, Tomasz Gyaro, and uh, Professor, uh, Priest uh, uh, Franciszek Longchamp de Berrier. I believe that all of our students, but also all um, our guests today, I would like to suggest the Roman law. Uh, and the subtitle to this Roman law says the basics of private law. But since among us there are definitely better specialists in this Roman law, I would just uh, allow myself to add one more sentence that, well, repeating after those uh, authors mentioned, mentioned before, we can see a trace uh, of Roman law even in the, in the public law. This uh, the ABC of the political categories, like republic, monarchy, like... I guess uh, there were two more, but I can't remember now. Uh, probably federalism and unitarism. These ideas, these concepts uh, of organization of the state can also be derived from the Roman law. But since we are speaking of the state, I believe that one of our um, distinguished guests would like to say a bit more about the Greek heritage in uh, their ideas of the state and the rules that should be um, accepted in the state. Thank you very much. I don't know, of course, 100% how, how the authors of this topic, what did they think about, about the civilization in the modern world, the heritage it has. But I think the most important thing is that the word heritage is a positive word, is something that has resisted, has survived, and it obliges us in a way. As you have said, Professor, uh, related to the Roman heritage, that in many Western universities it is not at all positive to um, be based on the Roman uh, theories because it's also white men theories. So we should get released from that and uh, overpass this, this law. Your comment might be either to some other performances or to the topic as you wish. Um, I hope you can hear me. I'd like to thank you for the invitation. I would like to start by saying that I have been present here in this conference since morning, but virtually, as uh, is normal, as is a custom nowadays. I have been watching you, listening. I'll take my glasses off so that you can look me straight in the eye. And listening to all these great speeches right from the start, from the first one, through all the other ones. Really great. And I was thinking, why have you invited me here? What can I say? What can I add? myself. And at a certain moment, I thought, let me share it with you, I think it was a speech by Mr. Bartosz Lewandowski, the dean. I thought, hmm, perhaps maybe they invited me only to convince me that I should study in this school. I should take up some post-diploma studies here. And I thought, I'm 
still thinking about it. But since I have been invited not as a student, but as a speaker, I believe I should take up um, this challenge and um, speak about the topic that has been uh, presented. Namely, uh, allow me that I will, if I put my glasses on, it will sound more serious. Legal heritage of the Western civilization in today's world. Heritage in today's world. What does that suggest to us? Um, I think um, editor um, Lisicki has mentioned something about it. We lawyers think about inheritance, and inheritance means about the death of somebody. And we are thinking, well, isn't it the truth that we are now speaking of the death of um, of that Western Latin civilization. Because the panel, uh, the title of the panel, doesn't sound the Latin civilization in today's world. No, but it says heritage. It speaks of heritage. So we could, uh, well, pull in your leg a little, but we could also ask, is it not some sort of a camouflaged information that the Western uh, civilization has cywilizacji łacińskiej dokonany przez współczesny świat. A więc współczesny świat. Maybe at the hands of today's world, we could assume. So we could also draw the conclusion that today's world has murdered the Western civilization. And what about the heritage? Well, perhaps, perhaps uh, it has not been so entirely evil that this uh, allowing a part of this heritage to remain. Because the Western world has not been, uh, has not deserved to inherit, having murdered the Western civilization. But even though, what happens with this, uh, with this heritage? Well, it has been left behind. Nobody has taken it up. It's been left there. It's being slowly overgrown with weeds, like an old field. Maybe even the rightful uh, uh, hares have forgotten about it. They forgot that it belongs to them, that it's their responsibility to cultivate it, to pick the weeds, uh, to blow the ground, to sow the good seed to take good care of it and in the end to reap the deserved fruit. Well, that's just uh, one of the parallels that uh, I thought about, maybe some, some, some free thoughts concerning the title of this panel. But the question is, what is the real um, situation of this um, legal heritage of the Western civilization into this world? Um, well, partly because of uh, laziness and lack of time, I will not um, venture to have some kind of a scientific analysis. I'll take a shortcut. I'll give you an empirical example, which I have remembered very well. And more than 20 years ago, during one of my classes at the Warsaw University, and the problem was related with the form of legal action, namely um, a loan. We're speaking of the form, written form, ad probationem. We all understand what it is. And the student said, if uh, we have a loan of that time, ad probationem, for the, time, for the aim of evidence should be uh, uh, has been um, contracted orally instead of in a written form, there is no obligation because nobody's going to prove it to him. I tried to convince him uh, to accept an error because I thought it was one of those um, hmm, difficult cases. No. It was my 
clash. I am speaking with the Huntington's language. A clash of civilizations. And then, only then, I realized that we are living in two different worlds. That cannot coexist in the same place and in the same time because they would have to clash inevitably. They cannot coexist. To właśnie zrozumiałem na tej mojej This is what I understood that day. I think I learned much more than that student. But perhaps, well, we are learning throughout all our lives. And, ladies and gentlemen, what is this very civilization we're speaking about? I mentioned the name of Samuel Huntington. Everybody knows it. Everybody's heard it. But we have to mention, not just because we are in Warsaw, in Poland, some other important uh, names. And I think uh, it has been greatly um, a great inspiration for Huntington, some people say. Well, I don't know if it, this has been the truth. But I would like to recall, this is my duty, um, of uh, accountability, Mr. Felix Konechny, of course, and his numerous works. A great part of his uh, scientific life he devoted to working on civilizational uh, questions. But in, uh, in particular, uh, his work on the law in Latin civilization. He defined civilization as a, as a method of organizing social life, the way we are, we exist with each other, according to what rules, not our individual lives, but our uh, communitarian lives. And at the same time, the law becomes one of the most important factors that shape this life one of the crucial elements defining uh, the civilization, telling us what kind of civilizations do we have. He pointed, well, not just him, of course, two sources of the law. I'm not speaking of the natural law, of course. Power, which could be otherwise put as strength, imperio, the strength of the state the strength of the society an organized society and morality as the second source. And he tries to convince us that the very essence of the Latin civilization was it's the eternal connection of the law and the morality, not cutting morality off. This is the essence of the thing. Roman law, yes. However, this has not existed in a vacuum. There are many elements that coexisted, co-influenced it, because we, the Europeans, anchored in this thought. We have de been developing it, enriching it. Not just uh, the antiquity. Don't forget about the Middle Ages. For example, if I were to say not the Middle Ages as such, but the age of cathedrals, that, that's a great era in human history we should remember about. It's true that the strength, the power of the state supports the law. Of course, it's clear. That's how the state works. That's how the law works. There has to be power. There has to be um, strength. But similarly to politics, the politicians cannot separate one from the other. Of course, they, they sometimes do bad things, evil things. But throughout the centuries in Europe, politicians, by breaking the law, uh, governing uh, unjustly, doing evil, have ever been trying to convince us that it's not the truth that bad law is in fact a good law, that it is not immoral, that it is absolutely observant of the morality. 
Only later they have invented the idea of a morality, of a non-morality, immorality. What does that tell us? It's a proof that even uh, by negating uh, what they were obliged to, they accepted the existence of these rules. It's just they didn't pay attention to them. As a kid, I remembered very well from my family home that sentence. Maybe because it was very melodic, and I remembered it in French. I suppose uh, professor knows this language. That the society is orientated metaphysically, or there is no civilization. Zorientowana metafizycznie, albo nie ma cywilizacji. To jest właśnie ujęcie tej kwestii. I think this is the way to put this problem of law and morality. Proszę państwa, nie dzieje, nie if we don't do it in the name of any good, siły. We only do it for, in the name of power and our own selfish interests. This is why this manip linguistic manipulation, uh, which has been uh, mentioned today by Justice Borrego, because very often it is all about creating new words, new terms, adding some adjectives that will uh, reverse the, the original meaning of a term but still it's just a manipulation aimed at uh, uh, making us believe that those who do it re represent some good. I do believe, however, and maybe this is going to be a risky, uh, a risky conclusion, but also as kind of a uh, a warning that we are approaching the times when this will no longer be the case, where people will no longer try to present good, the evil as good, but to present evil as evil and put it on the altar. And we are approaching these times. And this is going to be the real end of civilization. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Speaking of the Latin civilization, if we try to um, find some of its elements, we can find many of them in numerous areas of law, private law, public law. But I believe that its very nature has also been included in the title of today's conference, not just this panel. You titled the conference Intermarium Intermarium as the space of freedom and order. That's right. The order without uh, freedom is just a tyranny. It's nothing more but a tyranny. If somebody says he'll bring order without taking into account the freedom of others, um, their independence, their opinions, then we are we have uh, a different language. Befehl, Ordnung, Gleichschachtung. And this reminds us clearly of the Nazis. This has been mentioned before today, in the beginning of the conference, from the Teutonic Knights, where the cross was placed. But it was just a false world. The essence was completely different. And then it just spread to Prussia, it infected Germany. And now this way of thinking has been infecting Europe and us. Freedom and order. You can create order only if it is created by free people. A condition of the real order is freedom. A wise republican freedom. Who does not say, do whatever you want. Which shows the direction. Which is related, tightly related with um, responsibility. Because we are not just individuals. We are not just living in an isolated way. We want to be together. 
our freedom is a thing we share within a group, wisely directed. That's why Inter Marium, the way I read it, the way I connect it with this panel's topic is a shared space in which, uh, well, it is something completely different than Middle Europa, even though geographically it's very similar. In different um, areas of life we could speak of this presence uh, of uh, Roman legal heritage. That there are less and less of these elements. Let's think of administration. It's um, a sphere of life that it's, has been close to me for, for a number of reasons. In the Roman civilization, administration is an organism. A living body consisting of people who organize and manage their own business in a civilization uh, which is against the Latin civilization. It is just a mechanism. And a human being is nothing uh, uh, but a part of the machine, executing functions because he does have no understanding at all about the purpose it serves. We could give many more examples, uh, but not in the, the form and the, within the time limits that we are having here. And just to finish, a quick reflection, what, what awaits us, what will happen with this heritage of the Latin civilization? I would still present an optimistic perspective. I think that people want to live in the world of order, justice, peace, good and beauty. People want to live in the world that this civilization proposes, that this civilization that has been proven for centuries, the Latin civilization, but very often don't realize in what situation, in what circumstances they are at the moment. And we have to make them conscious of it. We have to explain it to them. What is this civilization? What is the law? What does it mean in the Latin civilization? That it doesn't just give them uh, a sense of safety, security, but it's a real safety, which is one of the basic need, human needs. How can we make them aware of that? And I think you have found the answer, and this is right here in front of us, the name of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this optimistic thought in the end, because very often uh, we speak about the fall of the world, the death of civilization, and uh, the world of the West will just disappear. And now look, we have this optimism. There is still some life, because we have to believe in the human being. People are incredible, and people can help us believe in the world, because who saves one person saves the world. But I will still believe that the faith in man in today's world uh, can be uh, more difficult than before. That this nominalism uh, that we're facing every day uh, is something new we haven't faced before. Maybe it's a distance perspective, but can you give us some practical examples uh, of this uh, uh, fight, uh, of, this, uh, of this conflict between the legal heritage in today's world? This discussion, this argument, we talk today uh, the thesis of Professor Majrowski talking about heritage, is it an open uh, stage or is it something new that we are building on the rocks of the previous civilization? Or is it a new state that we have to define once again and find ourselves in it? And this moment in which we are now 
pytanie, czy je ewolucja. It's a question, is it a moment in the evolution? Pewnej rewolucji, która się... Or a revolution that we can see. Czy właśnie e, przerwaniem... Or maybe an interruption of... Uh, the continuation of one civilization and uh, the outbreak of a new civilization. I think that we are still on the stage when we look from the point of view that uh, Professor has mentioned. I think it's rather evolution because we see that some processes, some progress to achieve uh, the desired forms of organization when we talk about the law in the 20th century According to many uh, before given hypotheses, uh, they found themselves close to the ideal that people have uh, had invented before and when it comes to uh, benefit of uh, political freedom, uh, they can gather the wealth, they can get involved in politics and the country is much less repressive than the country that was hundreds of years ago when it comes to guarantee uh, the, the justice, sense of justice, and maybe the moment that was aimed for many, many years and uh, took place in the 20th century uh, become the, became the moment in which those hypotheses from the previous uh, years and centuries um, turned out that there is a new ideal because this is not what we are aiming to. And here we have this question, is this moment that it, for some people wasn't that the aim or is it just the, the beginning of something new? And when we look at the aspect of uh, of this battle, actually, because when you look at the title of this panel and those declarations that we have seen during this conference, the the heritage, the, the university, we can't hide that this is a kind of, uh, we try to answer if these values are they close to, to what we consider freedom in an American way, um, created by many thinkers of previous eight centuries? They were showing us that the human being has to live in a society, uh, he has to aim to live in a republic. When we think about Vincente Kadubek, and it becomes his uh, chronicle begins, the Respublica, in our society, we see the idea as a republic. Well, it is not totally the, the way that the direction that the nowadays world has taken. We see that why have we renewed the idea of the university? Why? Because its idea, which is developing for so many years now, is an idea completely different, is a closed idea to any polemic, to any um, tradition. It tries to subordinate everything to the doctrine of ideology, of politics. And many people see that it threatens uh, other values and sensitivities. And this is also the moment of truth that our editor here has mentioned. We are thinking if universities in a classical way, in many places in the world, also in Poland, becomes a place where it has been referred to, which is the freedom of speech, of thought, of research, and also of presenting one's own views. Or today, we see it's rather closed. So if we see at the level of higher education, there has been some big change. Can't we see? Uh, can we think that this trend would be um, dominant also in the law? Is it built, this trend, on the legal um, rules that are uh, to be um, kept? 
vigilant. This view that we see today, that not every thought is desired that can enter into life, will bring us to the uh, very good legal methods to build a new society. As the professor has mentioned about the difference, the biological one, the gender one, which is a creation from the last few decades. The, the second article of the European Treat says that there is equality between men and women. This is one of the values of the European Union and the fight against this inequality. So there are lots of legal acts of different importance. And usually the motives of, uh, of those loans are or more, much more the same. In la last year, uh, some uh, notions that were uh, assumed as granted many years ago now disappear from those streets, like uh, a man and a woman, yes? But when this second article finishes in other official EU documents, uh, the, last, the last few words are cut. They are replaced by gender equality, not men and women equality. And this is what we are discussing today in the extent of the, the role of the law, the role of the law. And in our civilization, it is uh, the possibility of uh, making from new words new laws. And uh, when somebody gets into notions, then uh, the law is affected. Not as we simply think, okay, there is some new rule, some new act, and everybody should uh, obey it. No. It happens on the way, on the level, on the EU, in every small act. They introduce this notion, and later there is a further discussion. For example, on the base, uh, based on the foundation of the civil civilization, how does it should how it should work, how the society should be functioning. There are many acts, bills, laws, and people who try to question those acts. But you know, in your law, it is it's been present for so many years. Why are you questioning that? Here you you ask the, our moderator ask how does it change in, uh, how does it change the law? And today, the answer to the challenges that we face and we, uh, we discuss during those uh, consequent panels and the discussion that uh, the public discussion that we see nowadays, in my opinion, we are at the point that the tools that were created by our civilization, such as uh, a place where we could realize ourselves, our freedom, today those tools are, used, are being used to create a state that actually limits the freedom of their citizen. So for so many years, the human being tries to be as free as possible. The laws created by Republic are, are serving to this purpose. But actually, nowadays, by changing those laws, we, we, we cancel all those frames that before were the guarantee of the order. And this is what is uh, a key point when we talk about freedom. Nowadays, those mechanisms are very subtle. The problem of gender, as uh, you have mentioned before, is just one of them. But the redefinition of expectations of the freedom, there are much more of that. 
and the law and the heritage, the legal heritage, we can say, of our culture area is simply just a tool to implement those programs. Thank you so much. This reminds me of the debate um, which had place in Poland um, uh, regarding the term LGBT, whether it refers to people or an ideology, which has been greatly uh, based on a certain legal, um, logic uh, contradiction, because when we uh, speak of it, uh, we want to uh, attach it to a certain arbitrary decision uh, who, whether you are a man or a woman or who is a man or a woman, then, I mean, logically, uh, we, um, we reach an aporia contradiction. Uh, that's why demanding equal rights for men and women and at the same time uh, the right to choose whether you are a man or a woman, I mean, this is contradictory. It makes no sense. I think one of the biggest problems of today's the uh, problem is that the category of contradictional logic has been kind of turned back. Um, we turn our backs to it. But we uh, try to keep a certain order, and now I'd like to, um, to speak. This is not going to be an online conversation, but it's going to be a, a video uh, by Miss Ligia de Jesus Castaldi, uh, who has pre for, uh, prepared a lecture for us. Thank you. Please listen. I would like to thank Ordo Juris and Collegium Intermario for this invitation to briefly speak today about the legal heritage of Latin civil law in the contemporary world. It is an honor to be a part of this event on freedom and order even if remotely. I will speak about the one contribution of Latin American civil law systems that I consider to be the most meaningful or significant to the current framework of international human rights law. And that is the legal recognition of the unborn child as a human person entitled to the right to life in Latin America. That contribution, um, that Latin contribution can be primarily illustrated in the American Convention on Human Rights. This is an international treaty adopted by most Latin American and Caribbean nations that establishes an international obligation to legally protect every person's right from the moment of conception, as you can see in the text here. Article four of the convention has been identified by international human rights scholars as the most emphatic recognition of the prenatal right to life to date in any international treaty. The recognition of a right to life from conception in this treaty seems to be distinctly inspired by the region's predominantly Catholic values, a Catholic vision of human rights, a Catholic moral understanding of the natural law in general, and in particular, um, a respect for prenatal life. Latin American states have also contributed to the understanding of the Convention on the Rights of the Child as protecting the right to life of unborn children. Since uh, the pre preparatory work of the 1959 Declaration on the Rights of the Child, which led to the adoption and parts of its text made it to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, Latin American states affirmed their view that the child's right to life was protected from the moment of conception. In a proposal introduced by Argentina and supported by all the Latin American states enumerated here, Latin American and Caribbean states. Um, so again, that declaration then led to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which as you probably well know, was first drafted by Poland which I imagine is a fact that your country must be very proud of. The Polish representative to the CRC Preparatory Work Conference, um, his name, and I hope I'm not mispronouncing it, although I imagine I am, Adam Lopatka, indicated that the convention was intended to allow states to legally protect the unborn child. This was done by the introduction in the preamble of the terms before as well as after birth, quote unquote, when referring to legal protection, human rights protection being recognized for the, for children. So it would apply before as well as after birth, therefore implicitly protecting the unborn child. So just as much as it was a Polish contribution 
to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, this have, had been supported by Latin American countries even, um, even before the convention was adopted in, in, the dec in the draft Declaration on the Rights of the Child, which later, um, the text of which later became the convention. At the domestic level, at the national level, Latin American nations have a long held uh, legal juridical tradition of recognizing and protecting the unborn child's right to life from conception. One that is very much alive today, that tradition is very much alive in 2021. Since the 1970s, Latin American countries have been pioneers in explicitly recognizing prenatal rights in their national constitutions. Eight states so far have adopted explicit constitutional provisions recognizing and protecting the right to life from conception, something that has not yet happened in any other region in the world. It happened with Ireland and Western Europe, which used to recognize um, the unborn child's right to life. However, that provision was um, over, overturned, as, as you know, by referendum in Ireland. These states, however, continue, have passed um, since the 70s, these um, constitutional amendments recognizing the unborn child's rights. And those amendments still prevail, prevail today. Honduras actually updated its uh, constitutional recognition of the unborn child's uh, right to life to specifically ban elective um, voluntary abortion. For all countries in the region, even those that do not have explicit constitutional protections, and I just wanna add that some countries um, even though some countries don't have explicit constitutional protections, some Supreme Courts or high courts, such as Argentina's, have found that their constitutions contain implicit uh, constitutional right protections uh, for unborn life, for embryonic life or fetal life. So many more um, constitutions have implicit protections, but in any case, there's a large body of domestic norms in Latin America and the Caribbean um, recognizing the unborn child as a person, as a human being, um, sometimes even as a child, and protecting his or her right to life from conception. These can be found in civil laws, uh, civil codes, juvenile codes, family law codes, um, and, and domestic, uh, primary, domestic primary laws. Several of these laws codify, for instance, the pro nascitus principle, which favors the unborn child um, in cases of doubt, when there is doubt about these, his or her existence in criminal and civil jurisdiction. Most civil codes also establish that the unborn is entitled to legal protection, even though he or she may not enjoy legal capacity or legal personhood for the purposes of civil transactions, which minors generally don't. A general presumption for unborn children and entitlement to property and succession rights is recognized in national civil codes as well, even though it is usually contingent upon a child's live birth, in which case it applies retroactively back to the time of conception. Some Latin American states have also recognized economic and social rights belonging to the unborn child, such as the right to health, survival, and development. These rights are perceived not merely as a right belonging to mothers, um, but also as a right of unborn children and equal protection is granted to both. In addition, some family law statutes have recognized legal parent-child relationships between biological parents and their unborn children involving some parental rights and duties. For instance, the right of a father to establish paternity before birth or the duty of a father to pay prenatal child support, um, alimentos graviticos, it is called in Brazil, for instance. Most states also authorize the appointment of a legal representative or a guardian ad litem for an unborn child in administrative or judicial proceedings that involve property or inheritance rights. That doesn't mean that proposals to abolish these prenatal life protections have not been uh, advanced. Uh, they have been, and uh, mostly in order to create a legal entitlement to elective voluntary abortion, both at the national and international level through the Inter-American Human Rights System and the United Nations systems uh, 
proposals to abolish prenatal life protections have advanced in Latin America. To date, however, um, as of 2021, no Latin American state has fully decriminalized abortion. Despite a significant prevalence, significant prevalence of abortion rights advocacy and pressure in international human rights politics, Latin American nations still categorize um, elective abortion as a criminal practice and continue to generally regard it as a violation of the unborn child's right to life and personal integrity, even where statutory provisions for non punishment of abortion exist. Other practices that directly affect prenatal life, such as forced abortion, fetal homicide, and fetal injury, are also sanctioned with criminal and civil, civil penalties in the region. Latin American and Caribbean laws generally establish narrow exceptions to the rules regarding abortion as a crime and waive criminal punishment for abortion only in limited circumstances, mostly when the mother is suffering from a life-threatening health condition. Other criminal punishment exemptions vary and the regulation is not homogenous in the region. Around half of all states have exempted abortions from criminal punish punishment where a pregnancy results from a sexual crime, such as incest or rape. And only about a third have passed exceptions for non-lethal health risks to the mother or for fetal viability or fetal disability, which um, can be properly called eugenic abortion. Decriminalization of abortion in the region has only been partial. It has been irregular, uh, inconsistent, and often advanced by the national judiciaries rather than the legislatures. High courts have been responsible for the creation of some grounds for abortion in states parties such as three grounds for abortion in Colombia, authorization for abortions of anencephalic children in Brazil, and for abortions of children conceived in rape in Argentina, and most recently in Ecuador. It must be said, however, that no decision authorizing the non-punishment of abortion in domestic high courts in the region has been unanimous. One or more judges have dissented in every instance and courts have been deeply divided over the issue, as illustrated by the Chilean constitutional decision, which upheld an abortion statute in, 20, in 2017. No Latin American state has decriminalized any abortions through popular vote. Only two states, Argentina and Uruguay, have decriminalized abortions via legislature adopted statutes. These countries, Argentina and Uruguay, currently have the most liberal abortion regimes in the region by allowing first trimester abor abortions. However, later term abortions that do not meet certain requirements continue to be illegal. And even in those jurisdictions, ele elective abortion is not celebrated as a constitutional right or as a human right of women, as it is, for instance, in the United States where abortion is a constitutional right. Elective abortion in general is not understood as an entitlement of the pregnant woman in Latin America or as a constitutional right in any Latin American jurisdiction. Arguments of female autonomy, privacy, and gender equality have been rejected as legal justifications for the creation of abortion rights in constitutional courts in the region, and the rights of the unborn child have always been brought up. Respect for prenatal life in Latin American Latin America and the Caribbean has transcended governments and partisan politics. Traditional allies of abortion rights advocates in other regions of the world have actively resisted decriminalization of abortion in Latin America. For instance, socialist presidents like Gabriel Vasquez from Uruguay and Rafael Correa from Ecuador have opposed decriminalization of abortion. The leftist Sandinista government of Nicaragua has fiercely defended its full abortion ban against enormous international pressure, including sanctions, financial sanctions from some EU countries. Medical organizations and professional colleges, as well as top academics have spoken against abortion in Argentina, Chile, and other countries. In contrast with North American and Western European professional organizations and academia, which have traditionally sided with abortion rights advocacy. 
That said, abortion rights advocacy has deeply divided nations, institutions, and individuals within Latin American and Caribbean countries, forcing them to take a position on a single issue that seems to have, been to have taken precedence over any and all other feminist causes, over any and all problems affecting women today, including poverty. Abortion advocacy has pitted believers against non-believers, liberals against conservatives, nationalists against globalists. It has raised larger jurisprudential questions in Latin America regarding constitutional interpretation, treaty interpretation, how new rights are created, and who has the authority to do so. Latin American law protection of the right to life of unborn children is no doubt under attack, both internally and externally. But for now, it remains as, its great, as one of the greatest contributions to international human rights law. Hopefully more Christian nations will, in the future, reject the false understanding of female empowerment and promote true nonviolent alternatives and compassionate support for girls, women, children, and families facing unplanned pregnancies. Thank you for your attention today, and I would be glad to um, get any comments or questions by email. Thank you very much. As we can see, we can understand this topic in many different ways, from a very particular aspect to a broader approach that we have been trying to present in our discussion today. Would anybody of you like to, 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 to add something else, to refer to the other speakers? We have touched upon many different ideas. Albo, albo z wystąpienia jeszcze? No rozumiem, że szczęśliwie dobijamy w takim razie do końca. I understand that we have uh, um, reached the end of our panel.